okay, good. Okay, so then, you know, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me, and, and I would love to be here with you, but uh, I got stranded in Munich basically for the whole day, and then I had to go back to Dresden on Monday. Um, but I'm very happy to be able to do it uh, by Zoom. And, and, and first off, I would like to actually acknowledge the people that did the work I'm going to present. So it's uh, Tom Quayle is a post, was a postdoc in the lab and recently is an RG as a group leader at EMBL, Basant, which is a, a last year PhD student. And Patrick McCall has been a postdoc as well in the lab for a while. And I don't know, I don't need to introduce much uh, uh, this slide, but but in general, part of my lab is interested in understanding how the cytoplasm and nucleoplasm are organized uh, by condensate. And I think the, the very nice talk by Frank already illustrated that condensates have uh, uh, emerging physical properties that will influence their functionalities. And the most obvious one perhaps is the fact that they might have viscosity or viscoelastic behaviors, and this can might affect uh, reactions. But also, um, condensates will typically have a surface tension, and they might interact with surfaces, um, which might exert forces. And this is, is the bulk of the talk would be about about that part. But also, other physical properties that have mainly been unexplored, like for example, an effective polarity, surface charges, changes in density, uh, smoothing compressibility, etc. And I think a challenge in the field is actually how to characterize these properties and how to actually measure them. And in general, and this I will talk at the end if I have time, one of the big challenges is also to figure out what's the composition of these droplets because that would actually change all these parameters. But for the first part of the talk, I'm just going to focus on uh, condensates interacting with surfaces. And, and, and one very clear surface in, in, the, in the cell is basic chromatin. And so I'm just going to be talking about condensates interacting with chromatin. But first, I need to say a few words about, about chromatin. Um, when the chromatin is packed in the nucleus, uh, and, and, and cells have found ways of compartmentalizing chromatin across the scales. At the simple scale, you have the, uh, the core histones wrapping around DNA, which makes the actual chromatin fiber. Um, and then at larger scales, you have uh, chromatin loops that bring enhanced and promoters together. Then these form uh, chromatin domains or, or topological associated domains, which are regions in the nucleus where uh, sequences are in close proximity. And finally, at the larger scale, you have uh, chromosomes that occupy uh, chromosome territories. Well, now, we made some progress on understanding what are the physical principles that actually govern this organization. So the smaller scale, you have the transcriptional machinery interacting with DNA that will end up forming these chromatin loops. At the larger scale, at the topological associated domain scales, you've got um, molecular motors that extrude loops, and that just creates these essentially large loops. And then at the larger scales, you have um, uh, chrom chromatin, chromatin, uh, chromatin domains, basically, that are thought to be separated by polymer-polymer uh, interactions. And so today, I want to focus on the, on the smaller scale, uh, which is how a transcriptional machinery interacts with DNA. And so here, the, the big question, basically, is how um, uh, uh, sequences that need to regulate promoters, for example, enhancers, actually meet in space. And this is a challenging problem because Typically, enhancers are hundreds of kilovespers away from the from the gene that they need to regulate. Um, and so, how does this happen? Um, and the recent work has actually suggested that transcriptional machinery uh, phase separates and forms a condensate, and then DNA, but that might be around this condensate, might be unregulated. But of course, we know uh, um, from basic physics that if you have a condensate interacting with a surface, this might exert um, some capillary-like forces. For example. You know, at a larger scale, you would you would get drops uh, wetting the a spider web that actually buffer the tension, but also insects walking on water, right? As examples of capillary like forces. And so the question is, uh, are these you know these forces happening also at the micro scale of of a cell? Can we detect them? Can we extract the numbers associated to these forces? And how does protein biochemistry govern uh, uh, these forces? And so to study this problem, we just picked one uh, such one protein. Basically, uh, uh, FOXA1, which is a pioneer transcri transcription factor. And the structure of this protein is as follows. It basically has a global domain, which has a specific uh, sequence-specific DNA binding and, and two non-sequence-specific DNA binding sites. And it's flanked by two disordered N and C termini. Um, the essay we decided to, to use to study this problem was just a very classic uh, in vitro and single molecule essay where it, where you just uh, attach a strand of DNA on the cover slide, and then you, you add buffer 
um, and FOXA1. And you bind the strand by, by biotin subtabulating uh, molecules. And so here on the right, you see a movie of, this, of, 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 of three DNA molecules uh, in buffer. And one thing that is important to realize is that actually the genomic length of these DNA strands is always the same. This is lambda phage, but the only thing that we changed is the end-to-end -end distance. And so the, the strand on the, on the bottom is, is very relaxed, but the, the sun on the top is very tense. And so, and so now with these, then what we do is flow the protein, OXA1, and then see what sort of interactions you get with the DNA. And so here you see a picture of the DNA. And then when you add OXA1, the first thing we saw is that actually it makes this uh, small condensate that seem to web uh, the DNA. And that was interesting because it's in line with the idea that the transcriptional machinery uh, might face separate on DNA. But what was more in interesting was actually the fact that uh, for end-to-end -end distances that were uh, uh, smaller, and so they, you had a lot of uh, slag on the DNA, this protein uh, condensates actually reeled in uh, DNA and formed this uh, uh, DNA protein co-condensate. And so that's suggestive of, of this uh, capillary-like forces. But now one, one very nice feature of the assay is actually because we're using streptabidine, it has uh, four binding sites. And so sometimes what happens is that one end of two DNA strands will bind to the same streptabidine molecule, which will be this part over here on top, and but while the other one will just bind somewhere else, and you have this typical V-shape. And now when you when you add FOXA1, what happens is that FOXA1 starts coding the DNA slowly, and then it, as its concentration re uh, increases, then it starts zipping the DNA strand together. And so the way we interpret that is by making a thin film on the on the polymer and just by, again, capillary-like forces, then zipping in the DNA, similar to when you wet your hair. And so that two pieces of data suggest that FOXA1 can condense DNA in C's and trans, but biochemically, how does this work? And so just to make a, a long story short, we, we actually picked this, pro this particular protein that was figured out by somebody else because of, of the existence of several mutants. And so we took these mutants, which basically chopped uh, the C terminus, the N terminus, and then mutated the DNA uh, binding domain. And what we saw is that the capacity of this protein to co-condense is unaffected unless you remove the C terminus. And so that's actually suggestive that you have these uh, weak with interactions that mediate this co-condensation and are driven by the C terminus. And so with this data, the picture that emerges uh, is, or at least that we have, is that you have this um, uh, wetting and, and nucleation of droplets on the DNA strand. If the extension on the DNA strand is too large, the self-interaction by FOXA1 cannot reel in DNA. But if you actually lower the DNA tension, then these capillary-like forces are sufficient to drive the co-condensation of DNA uh, with them. And so to test actually this cartoon, uh, we team up with Frank and we developed a thermodynamic description of FOXA1-mediated DNA protein condensation. And uh, actually, the model is, is quite simple. So it just considers the free energy of this co-condensation process. And this free energy will depend on the volume um, of the condensate, if that's favorable. Um, and then uh, it would also cost energy because you need to create a surface. So you have this surface term. And then there's going to be, you have to also consider the free energy of the non-condensed uh, DNA, which essentially is the cost of bringing DNA into the co in the co-condensate. And I can discuss this expression if you want uh, later, it's a bit, a little bit long. Um, but this, this free energy typically has a shape like that as a function of the amount of condensed DNA in the droplet. So first you have an increase of energy because you have to overcome the, the surface uh, tension barrier, but then as the volume increases, then the free energy would go down. Um, but then this last term, if you try to put too much DNA on it, at some point it would be energetically unfavorable. In, you know, it, you're gonna have to start uh, uh, too much force to actually bring DNA in, and so this goes up again. So you have typically a, a minimum, and that just actually gives you what's the amount of DNA in the droplet as a function of the end-to-end -end distance. Now, if you increase the end-to-end -end distance, which is, is equal to increasing the tension, then this minimum would just actually shift to the left, and at some point, the energy uh, will be larger than, than um, not making a condensate. And this is basically a first order transition so, which means that as a function of end-to-end -end distance, you would have a condensate of decreasing size, but at some point it will just disappear and have no more co-condensation. And so, of course, we went and measured that. And so we looked at the size of the condensates as a function of the end-to-end -end distance. 
and indeed they decrease in size consistent with this free energy description and at some point they seem not to happen anymore and to be more specific about testing this first order transition where we lead, where we where we did is to look at the condensation probability basically whether at, at a fixed end to end distance whether you have condensate or not and you can see that essentially is one below a, a certain end to end distance and then beyond a critical end to end distance it just basically drops to zero uh, it's consistent with uh, as well with uh, with a theory now with these two pieces of data what you can do is measure the three essential parameters of the theory which is the energy per unit uh, volume of the droplet that you gain by, by, by forming the condensate, the surface tension associated with it, and also a critical um, length at which you don't condense anymore. And now with these three parameters and this uh, theory, you can also wonder or predict if you want what, what's going to be the force that the condensate exerts on the non-condensed polymer. And then it turns out that this force is pretty much constant uh, while you have condensate. But then the moment you disassemble condensate with, with the, this critical end to distance, then the force extension curve looks like a naked DNA uh, that you would get. But it's actually quite interesting. I'm sorry. And we also validated that um, with optical tweezers that give you the same value, which is about you know one piconewton. It's the force that this condensate can exert on DNA. And that's actually, I think, very interesting because it's very reminiscent of this uh, spider, of the droplets that, that wet the spider web which function is actually to buffer the tension on the strands. And so if you actually cut a spider web, uh, what's going to happen is that these droplets will buckle the, 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 the fibers inside, and that would actually tense the, the strand, uh, the, the spider web again. And this is very reminiscent to what this uh, condensate seems to, seem to be doing uh, on, the, on, the, on the DNA. Of course, that was uh, purely in vitro. So we wonder, that, you know, are these forces relevant for an actual nucleus? And so um, for that, what we did is took a, a nucleus in extract and add a lot, actually a lot of FOXA1 on, on, on solution. And you can see that actually this drives this small condensation of the, of, the, of the DNA that becomes microscopic. And at some point it would actually, um, would be so strong that it just gonna uh, collapse the, chrom the whole chromatin, chrom uh, chromatin into a ball. So you, have, you can see it now, and so it's also actually now the nucleus envelope is, is broken. But anyways, you can see that this force is actually relevant at the at the scale of the nucleus. At least they can be. And I'm oh, sorry, this is again the same example. So here you have a, a, if you increase if you keep increasing focus on concentration, then you see uh, these dramatic changes on the chromatin organization, and at some point it just becomes it just becomes a ball. So these condensation forces are actually strong, and so these basically. Um, uh, we wonder basically if that's like a general uh, mechanism, which is particular of this protein. And so we, by now we tested a few a few proteins, but then I'm just showing you here, for example, a mutant. If you mutate uh, uh, the FOXA1, one of the examples, then you can change the condensation force. Now, if you take another uh, transcription factor protein, TBP, and there's others also that they just do not condense at all DNA at any end-to-end -end distance. Uh, but actually, if you take uh, linker histon, and, and linker histon is an interesting protein because it's structurally extremely similar to FOXA1, um, this one condenses DNA very strongly. And for any end to end distance that we measured, we all, all, always see uh, condensation. So that kind of suggests that uh, these capillary like forces are tuned with, uh, with the sequence of these protein interacting, uh, protein chromatin interactions, basically. And so that leads us to propose essentially that. that Co these co-condensation forces might act as a chromatin remodeler. And for example, you can imagine that enhanced sequences might nucleate this condensate, and this condensate might really in DNA, and they also can act as scaffolds or other secondary uh, 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 components that are required for transcription. And because this uh, co-condensation is switch-like, um, it's interesting to think about um, transcription not only being affected by, by density, but also by mechanical stimuli that would be present in the nucleus. And for example, some such a such, uh, stimuli could be driven by, by loop extrusion uh, forces. And because we see that the forces that, uh, that, that, that this co-condensation, uh, uh, that this condensate exert, which are about one piconewton, are the same that we actually measured in loop extrusion, which is also of, of the same order, this suggests that these processes will synergize um, uh, together. And of course, the question that we would like to address in the future is how are these kind of more microscopic processes would lead to the large scale organization uh, of chromatin. And, and so we have some projects along these lines. But now um, 
towards this end, one thing that we did is, is to try to visualize some of these condensation events in a more native environment. And so for that, we could not use FOXA1 because FOXA1 is a protein that in our system is not expressed. So it's just present only later in the in embryonic stages. And so we wanted to look for a protein that is present basically in our system from the beginning. And for that, we looked at the link of histone. And the link of histone, again, is very similar to FOXA1, uh, but its role is actually to condense um, DNA uh, in the nucleus and it also uh, and it packing uh, histone together and, and so for example just to show some some data that suggests that the perturbing uh, linked histone affects the degree of condensation of the nucleus and here you have a wild type EM uh, uh, micrograph of, of, uh, of, uh, of a nucleus which is a chromatin domain but now when you when you do a knockout of H1 then what happens is that the nucleus uh, uh, expands and then you have less heterochromatic region so it's uh, it's involved in condensation, but also regulating on all processes like loop extrusion, essentially. And so to visualize the effect of this protein in a kind of native uh, uh, system, we are actually using Xenopus uh, extracts. Um, and, and, and so basically you get you can get 100% undiluted cytoplasm from frog eggs by crushing these eggs, basically, and taking this phase here. And this is a very nice system because uh, if you add DNA, it recapitulates processes such like such as the formation of the magnetic spindle, but also the formation of nuclei and the cell cycle. So it's basically like having an embryo developing in a test tube without the boundary of a plasma membrane. And it allows you to do very good quantitative imaging, but also add and remove components, etc. So it's a very convenient system. And so in this case, we add, so there's endogenous uh, embryonic link of histone, and we add some fluorescent one to actually visualize what happens there. And so when we added that, what we see is, is that there are condensates in the nucleus, but also there are condensates in the cytoplasm. And, and just to test that these are not an artifact of the labeling, if you, if you immunostain um, this nuclei and then label, then you also see that they are present uh, physiologically, essentially both in the cytoplasm and the nucleus. So that was very important control. And then the, con the, the condensate in the cytoplasm also um, form depending in a concentration of matter, which is consistent with phase separation. Now, of course, what the first thing that we saw is that, okay, so we see these condensates and then we wanted to see how the DNA uh, looks like. Uh, and the first surprise came when we saw that actually DNA is excluded from this condensate. So it's still, the protein still binds to DNA, but, but these condensates do not contain DNA inside. And that was actually very surprising considering the previous result I showed you before. But now if you look at the structure of the, of the protein, again, it's, it's exactly the same as FOXA1. But the difference is that in the somatic link of histone, you've got a, 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 a basically positive uh, disorder domain, while this embryonic one is present, you know, in this in our system, uh, uh, its charge is it's mostly is mostly neutralized, and so that maybe explains why you don't have um, this condensation activity so strongly. But it also, want, you know, then we also wonder what are these condensates doing in the nucleus, right? And so one thing that we want to realize is that when you let the system evolve over time, the nucleus keeps growing because you have nuclear import. And as the nucleus grows, these condensates actually start dissolving. Um, so you can see here some snapshots, but also the quantification. So the, the change in droplet volume, uh, the droplet volume just keeps decreasing as the, as the nuclear volume increases. And so that suggests perhaps that these droplets are instead reservoirs uh, of this protein that is required basically for rapid replication, for example, and regulating all the process. But actually, that was a little bit uh, uh, surprising because we have this condensate from the beginning. And if you look, typically how this condensate form in the nucleus, and these are two examples, nucleoli and cahal bodies, what you see is that when the nucleus forms, then you start having nuclear import. And then as the concentration of the, of the protein inside of the nucleus goes up, it would, create, it would uh, reach the threshold concentration for phase separation, and then you would have the emergence of condensate. But actually, instead, what we have is that from the be very beginning, you have large condensates, and then they dissolve. So it's a little bit the opposite behavior than what we expected. And so to investigate a little bit more that, we looked into the nuclear import of this protein. And so here on top, you see a control, which is basically an NLS and cherry. So it's a protein that has, well, it's, a, it's a basically a nuclear localization signal. So it's going to be imported immediately into the nucleus. And so you can see that as the nucleus grows and the signal, the, the intensity just goes up, right? So, so you have more and more protein that goes into the nucleus. But actually when you, when you measure it for for this uh, link of histone in the in, in the in our system, you actually see the opposite. So basically, what this suggests is that there's no nuclear import, or if it, if if there's any, it's actually very very small. And so then, 
how does you know how does this link histone get into the nucleus, and how do, do this does it form? And so of course it has to be you know because when you have the nucleus they're already there perhaps they come before the nuclear assembly, and so one way to visualize that is to just act, add uh, sperm DNA which is compacted into the extract and this would become decomp de decompact and then essentially and eventually form a nuclear envelope. And so here on the right, you will see the emergence of a, of a nucleus the moment uh, the NLS gets imported. So then you have, you will see a signal happening. So you can here see the, the DNA, the condensing, and then you can see the, suddenly some condensing appearing. And then after, then you see the, the, the onset of nuclear import. And so here you see the, the, the snapshots of the same thing. And so you see that the formation of condensates actually precedes the formation of a nuclear envelope. Uh, and so that suggests that, uh, that this, the surface of the chromatin is nucleating these condensates that wet the chromatids, and then when the nuclear envelope forms, then these condensates are entrapped into the nucleus, and that's how they would get there. Now, to test that this is really a surface uh, uh, behavior, basically, and, and it's driven by the surface and not by the bulk of chromatin, one experiment we did is actually coat uh, rigid DNA, uh, D, uh, rigid beads uh, with DNA, uh, uh, and then this, you can chromatinize them. And so basically what you have is a solid uh, a bit with a thin surface of chromatin. And now when you add this into the into the extracts, what you see is the rapid nucleation of condensates that wet basically the surface of this of this of this bit. And in contrast here you have the cytoplasmic condensates that actually take much longer to to nucleate. So that's basically the characterization. So surface nucleation extremely fast basically compared to bulk uh, nucleation. And and again chromatin the chromatin surface is sufficient to drive this uh, nucleation of condensates. So basically what this uh, tells us, I think, is that during metaphase, you have the nucleation and wetting of these condensates on the surface of chromatids that they grow. And then as the nucleus envelopes, uh, envelope forms, this engul engulfs these condensates inside. There's no nuclear import anymore, but then you have these reservoirs that as the nucleus grows, then will be dissolved and used. Now, of course, this uh, is an embryonic, like I said, link histone, which is different from the somatic link histone. And embryos are, have a very particular challenge, basically, which is that they need to divide extremely fast. And so this is a movie of a zebra fish embryo, just to see this, how this process happens, basically, in real time. It's, it's, it's fast. And, and, um, and one, again, one challenge of the embryos is that there's no gene expression for about 12 to 14 grams of cell division. So then you have the same store of protein that needs that is constantly divided, and, and cells just have to deal with this amount of proteins, right? And and if you have surface condensation, the question is, can you explain how linker histone works in a, in an embryonic context? So then generally, since you're going to divide the DNA every single time, proteins that localize or, or condense with DNA will be diluted from the cytoplasm exponentially, and at some point you would have very few proteins, right? Uh, and so that would be the expectation. And in fact, if you take a protein like uh, core histone, uh, you will see that the nuclear concentration actually decreases that has been measured. But actually, it turns out that the link histone concentration remains constant in the nucleus. And so the question is how, you know, can we explain this basically with surface uh, condensation? And to, to look at this problem, we also use a nice trick, which is to encapsulate extracts in, in oil emulsions, because that allows us to mimic basically different volumes. Uh, for per, per DNA, so it's basically we can change the nucleus to cytoplasmic ratio by using that, um, and you know this is how it looks. And so, if we have surface condensation, um, and we still again, like I said, we still expect basically that there will be a dilution of the cytoplasmic component, and therefore the nucleation rate on the surface would still be affected. But actually, one thing that I, I, I told you before, which we, we observed, is that there's also phase separation in the cytoplasm of this protein which actually will set the saturation concentration of the soluble fraction. And that has been shown, uh, for example, to buffer concentration in a paper of Tony and Trunk. And so in this situation, then depend, regardless of the, of, the, of the droplet volume or the cell volume, then you might actually buffer the surface concentration or the nucleation rate on the chromatin. And so to test that, we did uh, two experiments. So basically, we can make these droplets uh, without cytoplasmic condensate. And with the way you do this is by having the exit in calls, then it does not make any condensate. But then you add DNA and immediately encapsulate and take advantage of the fact that the surface nucleation is much faster than any drop of con uh, condensation in the cytoplasm. And so in this case, you would expect that there is a dependence on the volume. But the other thing you can do is just incubate your extract basically at room temperature 
allow for this condensate to form in the cytoplasm, then add DNA encapsulate. And in this case, you would, should have the concentration in the cytoplasm buffer. And then the surface nucleation should be independent of the cell volume. And so this is the experiment on top. You see the fact, well, you see the case where there's no cytoplasmic condensate. And, and, and so here's a small droplet, middle and big droplet. So you see here clearly that the condensates on the surface here are far less than in this case on the right. And this is the, uh, the quantification. So you, so you have a strong dependence on the number of condensates and the volume of condensates as a function of the volume of the encapsulated cytoplasm. While if you prepare the sample with cytoplasmic condensates from the beginning, then you see actually no dependence at all. So it seems that these cytoplasmic condensates are buffering uh, the surface nucleation and therefore the concentration of protein in the nucleus. Okay, so that leads us to this uh, model, which I, I like a lot because that's a, a, a mechanism that is independent or alternative basically to nuclear import. Um, and it relies on this sort of condensation. And that's in contrast, for example, on the gradual accumulation of material of nuclear import. And that might be particularly important in early, de early, early development. And so in one case, you have this uh, nucleation in the surface versus the rate of import. And I think what's interesting about the surface condensation model is that allows you to do something I think very difficult to do in phase separation, which, which is to buffer the total amount of protein, not the concentration, but the total amount of protein inside of the nucleus, independent of the nuclear volume, but also the cytoplasmic volume, which I think is something hard to do, but this mechanism actually does it. There might be other processes also that I that where surface nucleation might be important. For example, uh, mitotic bookmarking might be one process that also might be driven by surface nucleation that would make a lot of sense. And also some nucleolar proteins have been to uh, seem to actually wet the chromatids in metaphase that, are, that might also explain how they are enriched in the nucleus. Okay, so I want to just go back to, to the first slide I showed you. And then for the last five minutes, talk a little bit about um, the challenge, basically. So, you know, I've been talking about surface uh, interactions of uh, condensates and uh, with chromatin, but of course, there's all these other physical parameters that would be interesting to get into. But I think one challenge that we're facing is that all these properties will strongly depend on the composition on the condensate, or, or even, you know, how much protein you have in the condensate, right? If you want to understand chemical reactions, so just this question is very difficult to answer. So I just want to spend the last five minutes explaining a method that we developed that in principle can resolve an arbitrary number of components in a condensate in a quantitative manner. And, and so my postdoc insisted that I needed to show this uh, phase diagram again. And so, and so here you see basically the, the uh, uh, you know, phase separation driven by changes in temperature. And so if that was to be the phase diagram corresponding to this movie here, so you can have temperature versus concentration. And so you, you prepare your sample at A at, at, B, at A at high temperature, so it does not phase separate, but then you cross the binodal and you go to heat to point B, and then it would phase separate into a dilute phase and a condensed phase. And then one thing that is important, that, that's why I'm showing this phase diagram, is that there's a special line which is called tie line, which connects the diluted and the condensed phase. And this line is guaranteed to be straight line because of mass conservation. So, so that's something that's going to be turn out to be important later. Now, if you look at the state of the art, basically of, of, of building phase diagrams um, of, of mixtures, if you take as an axis the number of components and the other axis, for example, the type of polymer, and so you can have a very simple homopolymer, then low complexity domain, multiple domains, and, and, and the native protein, then the state of the art is basically that we can have phase diagrams of two components plus um, the buffer of a homopolymer. And then with one component, then we can have a phase diagram with low complexity. So that we're very far from you know, large complexity, but also for actually getting at native protein. And the problem with native proteins, first of all, is that you should not label them because if you label them, it will affect basically the, the, the properties dramatically. Um, and then there's a very few amounts of them when you purify them. So traditional methods basically are not sufficient. So you cannot basically use traditional methods to do that. So we would like to have an unlabeled uh, method that can, can do this with native proteins. But the other complexity as well, if you look, is that all of that is done in vitro. So if you also take into account the, the complexity of the environment, we're just very far away from getting to an ideal situation, which would be this corner here. 
Okay, so how do we solve uh, this problem? So we decided to do um, to use quantitative uh, phase imaging, and so basically this is exploiting the fact that if you look, for example, in DIC, so um, the dense, you know, you can see condensates, which means that there's a phase shift. Uh, so there's a difference in refractive index between the condensed phase and the dilute phase, and so that's why you can see that. Um, and one fact that was known basically in the past is that the refractive index is linear with the protein concentration. And so you can see here, for example, some examples of different uh, polymers. But that's actually, it's, this linearity is pretty, it, it's, it's valid basically for concentrations up to about 500 mix per mil, essentially. So, so for pretty much all the, all the concentrations. Um, yeah, I can wrap up in a minute or two. Um, and so the, so then there's a the relationship between the difference of refractive index and the slow um, and how the refractive index changes with concentration and then the differences between uh, condensed and dilute phase. And so basically by measuring the changes in refractive index, then you can actually get a measurement of the condensation of the concentration. So um, to do that though, we need to relate the phase shift that we measure with uh, quantitative phase microscopy with uh, uh, mapping the refractive index. And that of course will change, will depend on, the, on the, the path the light travels through the condensate and for that, you need to make a model of, of, of how the condensate looks like. And so we take a spherical cap from which we can take the height and then feed this quantitative phase imaging with, uh, with basically this, this uh, geometrical model. And that exactly gives you a perfect match basically with, with what the measurement we have. And with this, then you can have very precise measurements of the protein concentration uh, in a label-free manner. And then you can actually do interesting things, and that goes back to what Frank was telling telling us about of aging, for example. So here you have examples of aging, which correlate with the shrinkage of the volume. But actually, if you look at the quantitative phase, now you can measure the protein concentration, right? So you could think that, for example, this droplets might decrease in size because of also ripening, but in this case, you also have a huge increase on density. Now, if you also add another protein, for example, RNA, then what you see is that the density also changes while the volume doesn't. So now, you know, you can start looking at, into this uh, question. So now um, the question is how do you go, so now we can do it for native proteins, but how do you go for multi-components, right? And that's the last thing I'm just gonna tell you about uh, uh, rather quickly. So, so here they say we have RNA and polymer, so the phase diagram will typically look more complex, something like that, but you still have tie length. And so the idea is how do you actually get now the concentration of the RNA and polymer in the condensate? Now, if you prepare your sample at an average concentration P and R, then you're somewhere here. And then you make a condensate. And now we can actually use the refractive index uh, uh, difference to actually uh, place a line in this space. And so we know the slopes, this you can calculate. Then we, if you can measure the dilute phase, which is very easy, the only unknowns basically are the condensed phases. And that actually gives you a line. Now, the other thing you can do is use the tie line. And the tie line gives you a relationship, um, a linear relationship, where when these two lines cross, then it's actually telling you the concentration of the condensed phase of these two components. And then if you prepare your sample of different average concentrations, this is a way you can build at uh, the phase diagram, for example, for this. Uh, uh, two components, well, three components, if you include the solvent. And the nice thing is that if you have n components, right, an arbitrary number of components, there are going to be n minus one to the projections of the tie line of the hyper, you know, complex uh, plane of the tie line, plus there is a refractive line that would actually determine the whole system, and so you will always be able to actually uh, extract the condensed uh, concentrations. And that, for example, is an example of a phase diagram you can get from RNA and fuse. But I, I, I think I should uh, wrap up now. It's been 33 minutes. So there's interesting things you can do. Then you can see that, for example, the concentrate, the composition indeed changes from when you add uh, RNA at a fixed concentration of food, but the overall concentration is constant. So there are very interesting things I think that none, one can explore with this method. Um, anyway, so you can expand that. And, and yeah, I just want to finish again saying that I think to not understand these physical properties of condensate, the first thing we need to do is to measure composition. And I think, again, Patrick, the, the postdoc in the lab has provided this method, but I think it's gonna be very interesting to tackle these questions in the future. And so with this, I wanna acknowledge, first of all, collaborations with uh, with Frank, specifically on the co-condensation project, and also the Thomas Quayle, Basant, and Patrick uh, for the work that I presented today and funding, and thank you for your attention.
Yeah, it seems that it seems that not basically according to yeah. So basically, like the the this slope of the refractive index versus uh, concentration is just going to depend on the composition of the protein and not the structure itself. From past literature, basically, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question, Amy. Um, yeah, so I think again, so, so the the the, the linkage system we were looking at is the embryonic one, and so um, the embryonic, but you know, after a certain uh, stage of development, then you, you're going to have the somatic linkage system, and the somatic linkage system has a has a different um, uh, protein sequence, and so the disordered domain is positively charged. And then actually, what happens if you add this one into these extracts, for example? You have this massive condensation of the of the of the chromatin, and so you just make a ball essentially, and it collapses. And so, um, and that's again. So it, it's in, in somatic cells, it's important to have the linker histone, like the like the somatic ones, regulate loop exclusion, but also the degrees of compaction, and, and and there would be mechanisms in the cell that regulate the concentration of that one. But in embryonic systems, then you 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 have to you know you start with a typically you know um, embryos have different sizes, but typically you have a millimeter sized embryo. And the protein you have in the cell is what you're going to have for about 12, 14 rounds of cell division. So you have to have mechanisms that actually cope basically with this dramatic change, this dramatic scaling. And so this embryonic linkage histone is also involved, again, in regulating processes such as uh, exclusion and replication. And so you want to have a fixed amount of the nucleus, regardless of these massive changes that you have in the cytoplasm. And I think basically one way to do that is this surface nucleation that is buffered by cytoplasmic droplets. And this ensures that you have this constant amount of protein in the nucleus. And I think basically it makes a lot of sense that you don't rely on, on import in this system because there is, well, it's known basically that, that there's components that are outcompete import, in particular uh, core histones. Um, and that seems to be a mechanism to, re to silence uh, this nuclei for a few rounds of division. So for example, if you have architecturally important proteins, such as the embryonic thing histone, but others, the need to go into the nucleus no matter what, I think it's not gonna, it's not a good idea to compete with import, and so you want to have an alternative mechanism. I think that gives you that gives you one. Yeah. Okay, thank you. 